Hey, Vision Church, welcome to Church Online. Hey, before we get started, I want to give you some different ways that you're able to give this morning. You can give like normal on the website. If you give through PayPal or you want to give through Tithely, we have our text to give, uh, which the information is on the screen there. But if you're used to and accustomed to giving cash or writing a check, you can still do that. If you don't mind sticking it in an envelope, putting a stamp on it, and you can send it to our post office box, which is there on our website. It's on our Contact Us page. It's P.O. Box 7184, Springdale, Arkansas, 72766. Okay, so I wanted to let you know how you can give as we get rolling this morning, because it's all hands on deck, all systems are go in Vision Church. Are you ready for the message? Because here it comes. Hey, welcome to Church Online. Good morning, Vision Church. So good to see you guys. Hey, you might be wondering, why are we having Church Online? I wanted to answer that question first. You know, first of all, uh, the CDC, the city of Springdale, which by the way, I met with the, the mayor of Springdale with many of the other lead pastors of Springdale. We prayed together and, you know, he communicated uh, with us as well. He didn't put any restrictions on the church. Um, but he did say that they were complying with what President Trump had asked. President Trump had asked that we would, you know, uh, not have gatherings larger than 10 people. And so that's why we decided to comply as a church. You know, Romans 13 says to make ourselves subject to the governing authority. So uh, we're going to do that in this case, but we are super excited to be able to still have church online, still connect with our family, because we love you. We appreciate uh, you so much. And I wish, you know, if, if you were here in person, I could give you a big hug. I could give you a fist bump. You know, I, I, I don't do social distancing super well. Uh, I haven't learned how to do that. Thank God. Um, but let me, let me say this to you as well, that, that if, if we had been asked to do something that was against, uh, the Bible against Christian principles, then we would have said no. We were not asked to do something against biblical principles, against our, you know, our Christian faith. And so that's why, uh, that's why we wanted to, to do it this way uh, for this Sunday and for next Sunday. So would you pray with me? Let's agree together because the faith is super strong right now uh, between us. And God is not limited to us meeting together physically, but we're, we can meet together online and the Spirit of God can flow through the internet. <laughs> Would you agree with that? But let's pray together. Father God, we just pray right now. Lord, I pray that you would be on my mouth, that you would be in my heart, flow through me, flow uh, in any way that you need to, to be able to communicate your encouragement to our church family and to all those that are listening. I thank you for it in Jesus' name. And if you agreed, if, you, if I could hear you, I'd say, say amen. So say amen this morning. You know, what was on my heart this morning is that we're in trying times right now. We're in interesting times. These are times that we have never lived through. Nobody has ever experienced this. My kids haven't experienced. My grand, my, my mom, uh, their grandmother has not experienced this in her li lifetime, even though she was born before World War II. You know, and this is something new. And so what do you do as a person of faith? What do you do as a person that believes God, that stands on the word of God when you're in the midst of trying times? Well, I feel God put some things on my heart, things that we can do in trying times, things that we should do. The first one is this. Number one, if you're taking notes, is that we should press in. We should press in. Phil, what do you mean by that? I mean that we should press into the presence of God. Hey, I know some of you that are watching are at home uh, right now. Maybe you've been sent home. Maybe your job has shut down. Maybe the restaurant has, you know, they, they've downsized or they've shut down for a couple of weeks. So you may find yourself with extra time on your hands. Let me encourage you in something. Press into his presence. Use this time as an opportunity to press into fasting and prayer. Let me tell you this, I heard this and this was so encouraging to me, that huge outpourings are preceded by times like this, times of trying. And I feel like God, if, if we'll press into him, a mighty revival will come out of this, a mighty harvest that he has in store for us. We're being set up. Man, you need to, whoever's watching this with you or nobody's watching it with you, you may want to say it to yourself. Say, I am being set up for a massive revival and a massive harvest in my life. 
and I believe it's true. Think about this. Think about Joseph. You remember Joseph. He had been sold into slavery. Then he had been thrown into prison. All of these things had happened to him, and in one day, uh, uh, okay, so those two things, uh, one more thing happened. The, the baker, the butler, they forgot about him. Here the butler had been restored to his position because Joseph prophesied his dream and told, interpreted his dream uh, to him, and he still forgot about Joseph. So now three things, three opportunities to take offense, but Joseph didn't take offense. Joseph decided to say what we just said, and that's that, you know what, I'm being set up for a massive harvest in my life. I'm being set up for a massive revival. And so what happened? He came out of jail and went to number two in the kingdom of Egypt in a day. Think about that. Man, it was less than a day. It was, it was just moments. Once he, once he interpreted the dream that God gave him the ter interpretation for, and he interpreted it for Pharaoh, all of a sudden, man, he is number two in the kingdom. And then what happens? He's saving people from pestilence, from the famine that was taking place in the land. You know, and God raised him up to be a savior. So his brothers come to him, and his brothers are apologizing to him. Once they realize who he is, they come to him, and they apologize to him. And listen to what? Listen to Joseph's words to his brother. Listen to what he says. In Genesis 50, verse 20, he says this. But as for you, you meant evil against me, but God has turned it for good. Man, let me tell you, the enemy will come, and he is trying to use this to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Don't worry about me. I just get emotional. It's okay. To steal, to kill, and to destroy. But God is going to use this to bring about a massive revival and harvest. Do you believe it? Look at, your, look at, look at yourself in the mirror. Look at somebody sitting next to you and say, I believe it. I believe it. You know, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, this has been a scripture that has encouraged me. Back in 2011, when my mom had a massive heart attack, this was the scripture that really solidified me in my faith, that grounded me in my faith. And that's this scripture. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, No temptation. You could also t say trial. You could also say test. No temptation, no test, no trial has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not allow. Man, think about those two words. He will not allow you to be tempted, to be tried, to be tested beyond what you were able. But he, but with that temptation, with that trial, with that test, he will also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Man, that scripture set me free. That scripture, when I was believing for mom's healing with dad, my dad was, and we were, you know, we were watching just these very minuscule uh, manifestations of God's presence in, a, in her life. But man, I was holding on to those. Every little, uh, every little thing I saw that was the steps to her being healed was a manifestation of God's presence in her life. And I hope that encourages you that what we're going through right now, what we're experiencing in our country, what we're uh, being tested in our faith with, because many of you are not only believing God, you know, for your health, for wholeness, but you're believing God for, you know, Lord, how are we going to make it through, uh, through this or financially? How are we going to make the, how are we going to be able to sustain where we're at? I'm telling you, be encouraged because God will not allow you to be tempted to be tested, to be tried beyond what he has given you the ability to overcome. How do you overcome it though? You, we need to take this moment, take this time, this opportunity to feed on the word of God, to build up our faith, to turn the television off, turn off reports of everything that we're hearing because we're being bombarded. It's not just the television, it's social media, it's your phone, it's your computer, it's, it's anything that's able to get in your spirit and begin to listen to the Word of God, begin to read the Word of God, begin to feed on it. So that's what is you draw on in these times of testing. You gotta have something to draw on that builds your faith, that encourages your faith, right? So that's number one. Number two is this, refuse to fear. This is so key, so key. I mean, we are literally watching before our eyes craziness, panic, uh, people that, that are making decisions based completely and entirely on fear. 
but I've read the scriptures, it's a very familiar scripture. You could probably quote it to me, 2 Timothy 1, 7. For God has not given you or given us a spirit of fear, but he's given us a spirit of power, love, and a sound mind. So if you're, having, if you're being tempted to fear, that's not coming from God. He hasn't given that to you, right? He didn't give you that. One of my favorite commercials on television is the Geico commercial that's the horror movie. It's the four college-age students, you know, or young people that are trapped in this horror movie, you know, and so they're, they're making terrible decisions the entire commercial, and then they finally make their last terrible decision, that's to go hide behind all the chainsaws in the barn, which is where the chainsaw massacre guy is, you know, and he's just rolling his eyes watching these guys, and then, and then the caption or the narrator says, when you're in a horror movie, you make bad decisions. Well, let me tell you this. When you're in fear, you make bad decisions. When you're in panic, you make bad decisions. I mean, what is it about buying toilet paper? Why all of a sudden do we need toilet paper? You know, when the coronavirus doesn't even really give you diarrhea. I mean, why? Because all of a sudden people started buying it. And then this fear got in that, oh, oh there's not going to be enough to toilet paper. I better go buy some toilet paper. I was so thrilled when I went to Sam's the other day and there were, there were 20 packets of water. All the other water was gone, but there was 20 packets because I was going, thank you, Lord, that fear is subsiding, that people are stepping out of fear and beginning to realize, you know what? I'm not going to panic because, man, when you panic, you make bad decisions. Let me show you a story in the Old Testament that proves my point exactly of what happens when somebody makes a decision in panic. You remember Saul. Saul now had been ruling for two years, and he selected 3,000 choice men. He had 2,000 choice men with him in a certain city, but then Jonathan had 1,000 in another city with him. And one thing I love about Jonathan is, he, man, he's like the line of the tribe of Judah. He is not afraid to start fights. So he takes his 1,000 men, they go and they attack a garrison uh, of the Philistines. And so then... It's like he awakens a sleeping giant. Now the Philistines are ready for battle. And so they assemble. And so they bring their chariots and their horsemen. And, that, and at that time, it doesn't mention that Israel had chariots or horsemen. So Saul, he blows the trumpet throughout the land and so that all the Hebrews can, he Hebrews can hear and all the fighting men come out to join him. And then let me show you, let me read to you in verse 5 of 1 Samuel 13 what the Philistines did. The Philistines gathered together to fight with Israel. 30,000 chariots and 6,000 horsemen and people as the sand which is on the seashore uh, in multiplication. And they came and they encamped at Michmash uh, east of beth Aven. And so, so all the men of Israel see this vast, massive Philistine army. And what do they do? They go and hide. Anywhere that they can, the Bible says that they went and they hid in, in caves and they hid behind trees and they hid down in creeks and everywhere that they could find to go and to hide. And why? Because they were very much afraid. Now, Saul had told Samuel about this battle that was about to happen. And, and Samuel, the prophet, told Saul, I'm going to meet you there at a specific time. And so what's happening is because this mass army of Philistines, you know, panic set in and fear set in and all of a sudden all of Saul's men begin to abandon him they begin to leave and all of a sudden Saul is left with 600 men now wouldn't your heart begin to sink if you started with I mean let's say because the number of fighting men at that time was around 600,000 so let's say that you've gone from 600,000 down to 600 men how would you respond how would you feel if you were there and so Samuel the appointed time comes for Samuel to come, come because Samuel is a critical uh, uh, weapon in this because he's the one that's going to give the sacrifices. He's the one that can hear from heaven and hear what they need to do. Well, he doesn't show up at the appointed time. And so Saul decides in panic. He makes a decision in panic, in fear, and he decides to give the offering himself before the Lord. And then Saul comes, or Samuel comes, and Samuel says in verse 13, he says, you've done foolishly. Why have you not kept the Lord's commandment which he commanded you? For now the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever, but now he has torn it away from you and he's going to give it to another man, a man who has a heart after him. 
So see what happened to Saul? Panic caused him to make a foolish decision, and as a result, the outcome of his life changed. Well, here's the good news. We're now in the New Testament. Jesus has died on the cross. We're under a new and a better covenant. And so when we allow ourselves to get into fear, to fall into fear, we can come before our Father and we can, we can apply 1 John 1, 9 and, and come with confidence before the throne of heaven and ask him to forgive us. And he'll restore our lives. Man, and that's really what Saul should have done. He should have had a repentant heart, but he didn't have a repentant heart. Fear causes panic. In Job, Job chapter 3, verse 25, Job said this, he said, the thing that I, the th I'm sorry, let me start again. For the thing that I greatly feared has come upon me, and what I dreaded has happened to me. What that means is prior to what happened to his, his entire estate and, and all the money that he had and, all the, and his children and his family and all of the, the donkeys and the, and the camels that he had, all of his vast wealth was taken from him in a day. But this fear, this statement says that he had that fear long before that stuff was taken away from him, long before all those things happened. So you, you have to realize, you and I, that we are under a new and better covenant and that the invisible, impenetrable armor of the presence of God is on us and we can rest in his ability to protect us. Say amen to that. Man, that's good preaching. So Psalms 91, I'm, I wanna read verse six to you. This is in, out of the NLT. It says, do not dread the disease that stalks in the darkness. Do not dread the disease that stalks in the darkness. If you've had an opportunity through this whole scenario, this whole um, coronavirus opportunity that we've had, and you've, and you've allowed yourself to begin to slip into fear, it's time to pull back and go, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm not going to allow fear in my life. So, so I'm telling you this. It's time to us to realize again, what do we believe? Is was the blood of Jesus enough? And is the blood of Jesus enough right now? And the answer is absolutely. See, the more you hide yourself in God and his word, the more you will trust what he said and you will believe his report instead of other people's reports. In Mark 4, verse 24, Jesus said, consider carefully what you hear. See, sometimes people justify fear uh, in, in terms of concern. I'm just concerned. Well, let, let me ask you a question. How much fear is permissible? How much fear is okay? If you were about to buy some water and you found water on the shelf that says 90% pure, would you buy the water? What if, you bought a, what if you bought a cake mix and you found out that there was 000.6% arsenic in it? Would you buy that cake mix? No. Why? Because None of that is okay. I'm only going to buy water that is pure. I'm only going to buy a cake mix that is, is approved by the FDA, right? You know, we're, why? Because we don't want to allow that type of impurity in our, in our life. Well, let me tell you something real quick. When Nicole and I were married and, our, and, and Zach and Becca were just little babies, Zach was one, Becca was two, they're 16 months apart. And we had moved into our first home. Now this is the first home that I owned and, and I felt this huge responsibility now as a dad, you know, that this is my home and this is our land and, 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 and my job is to protect it. But here's what happened. I allowed fear to begin to sneak in. And so I would wake up in the middle of the night, literally. I would get out of bed and go and double check the windows, make sure that our lights were on, make sure the front door was locked securely. And, but what happened was I wasn't doing it out of, um, out of a heart of, oh yeah, I may have forgot to lock the door. Oh yeah, I think I forgot to do this. No, I was doing it out of fear. I was allowing the root of fear to begin to get into my life. And this was a nightly thing for me, so much so that I was beginning to have difficulty sleeping at night. And, and I, I gotta tell you, so many of the things that I was feeding on at the time were promoting that in my life because that, that can promote things in your life as well. But let me tell you what happened. One night at 10 o'clock at night, I was back in my bedroom getting ready for bed. Nicole was up in the kitchen and the kitchen was right by the front door. And she yelled back to the bedroom and said, honey, I said, what? She said, our truck just started. And I said, what? 
and I ran out the front door just in time to watch my Suburban go drive down the neighborhood street, leaving. Somebody else in it besides us. Take it, and, and you know what happened? I realized my fear has drawn this to me. What did Job say? Job said, what I dreaded more than anything has come upon me. He said, what I feared more than anything has happened to me in, in chapter three, verse 25. And so I allowed the fear that got in me to open the door for the enemy to come in to steal, kill, and to destroy. Well, after we filed the police report and we talked to the policeman, I, you know, I, I said, you know what, God? This is my fault. And I sat down with Nicole. I said, honey, this is my fault. And she said, what do you mean it's your fault? And I told her that I had allow, allowed fear to get in my heart. And you know what? We have prayed. We agreed. I repented. <laughs> Thank God. We can come. We can repent. And I did. And do you know what happened? An hour later, I got my Suburban back. An hour later, the police found it. And, and it was unharmed, you know, except the little you know, part where they had to break something to be able to start it. But man, I got my Suburban back. And do you know what? God even made sure one of the guys paid restitution even. I mean, it's amazing that God did that for me. But then let me tell you, there's been nights uh, ever since that I accidentally slept with the garage door open. But I just come out, I shrug my shoulders and go, oh well, God, I'm, I didn't do that on purpose. Thank you, Lord, that your angels protected us. But I've refused to fear. And let me tell you, we're having opportunities right now. It may be a financial fear. It may be a health fear. It may be the fear of the unknown. But my question to you is, is the blood of Jesus enough? Is the blood of Jesus enough? And what's the answer? Yeah. But you have to answer that for yourself. And you have to decide in your heart, you know what? The blood of Jesus is enough. And he's going to carry me through this whole thing that our nation is walking through right now. And I'm going to come out on the other side with massive harvest, massive revival in my heart and in my life. Number three, another thing that we should do in trying times is we can always continue giving. Always continue giving. Why? Because giving, uh, well, let, let, me, let me take you to a scripture first. Psalms 37 verse 25. It says this, I've been old, I've been young, and now I'm old, and I have not seen the righteous, or I like the way the NLT says it, the godly I've never seen them abandoned. God will not abandon us. And, and you know, it's a good idea to, to give during this time rather than to go out and make massive purchases during times that we're in, right? I mean, you're, you're, making, you're making decisions for yourself. You're probably budgeting right now in your mind. But let me tell you, this thing did not take God by surprise. He knew. God knew. And so we're not subject to this economy. We're subject to the kingdom of God. So think about this. Isaac sowed during famine. You remember there was a famine in the land and he was instructed by the Lord to go ahead and sow instead of leave. And so he sowed during famine. And when he did, he reaped a hundredfold return. Well, right now, your seed has become much more precious. Why? Because you don't, you don't know what the future holds. You don't know, you know when you'll get a paycheck when this thing will balance back out financially. And you may be looking at it as a time where you're going to draw back and, and hold back on your giving. But let me tell you, your seed has become much more precious in, when you sow. Remember the, remember the woman with the two mites? Because she gave, out of, she gave all that she had. She, she didn't give out of, out of her abundance. And so that's good news for us that when we get in these times, that when we sow in faith, then God blesses it. So trying times makes your seed much more precious. So keep the windows of heaven open and keep it coming, right? The fourth one is this, and this is the last one. Have a reverential fear for God. Have a reverential fear for God. Listen to what Titus says. Titus talks about living soberly. It says in Titus chapter 2, verse 11, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age, looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Living soberly means living with your eyes open and living with a reverential respect and a fear for God. The Bible says that the, the, the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. 
And so, I, you know, I think about it, and we, we, on Wednesday night, we played this song, but on Monday nights, we had this thing called Soak, where we, where, you know, we put on worship music, and everybody finds a corner, and it happens in, in this house that I'm in right here, where we all find a corner, and we begin to lay before God, and we begin to spend time in His presence. And this song came on, and I don't know the name of the song, but I know the chorus where it said, I want to be tried by fire, purified. And I just thought to myself as I was singing it, and the, and the first, I'd heard it the night before we were at, at an event where they were having a worship night, and I, that lyric came up on the screen, and I thought, dear God, we're just, we're, I can't just sing this without paying attention to what it says. The, the, I want to be tried by fire. I mean, think about that. I want to be purified. But, but those, those people that, are, that want more of God in their life and and who are living soberly are the same people that want to experience God burn off the things in our life that are not pleasing to him the things that don't honor him that don't bring glory to him I mean that's a very sobering thought wouldn't you say and so we shouldn't sing that lightly you know and and so many of us are are facing these trials and so we should live soberly in the midst of trials because trials are necessary. What do they do? They produce maturity in the believer. They grow us up. Why? Because they give us an opportunity to exercise our faith, to stand in faith. You know, you guys have heard me say the submission is not submission until you don't agree. Well, faith is not faith until it's tested, until you have an opportunity to stand in faith and to fight the good fight of faith. So I want to encourage you in something. You know, if you're going through a fire, don't let it bum you out, but get put into the, be so full of fire, so be so on fire that when you're put into the fire, you don't get burned. Does that make sense? That you're so you're so on fire for God that you've allowed him to burn away the chaff and to get rid of these things so that when you're thrown into the fire, it doesn't burn you anymore. Man, that was such a good word for me. I, I needed to hear that. So I'm going to end with this. Psalm 91, verse 6 in the NLT says this. I just read it to you earlier. Do not dread the disease that stalks in the darkness, nor the disaster that strikes at midday. So day or night, you're not supposed to be afraid. Though a thousand fall at your side, though 10,000 are dying around you as a result of those diseases, these evils will not touch you. And I'm telling you, it's time to put on, you know, I've heard it said, time to put on our big boy pants. You know, it's time to begin to grow up in faith. It's time to begin to put the blood of Jesus into operation in our life. It's time to seek God like we've never sought him to, before, to seek his word, to seek his presence, to spend time with him so that we can allow him to burn off the doubt, the unbelief, the fear, and burn that off of our life so that when we are thrown into the fire, like many are getting thrown into the fire right now, we don't get burned. We come out of it like the three Hebrews children on the other side, where we step out and the king says, hey, come out. I see you guys in there. Come out. That when we come out, the only thing that's burned off of us is those shackles and those, and those bonds that were binding us. I want to pray for you this morning because I believe many of you are being challenged right now. Many of you have been going through uh, things because you can't help what you see can't help what you see in the natural, but you don't have to be moved by it. You don't have to allow it to dictate your life. Acts 20, 24 says, none of these things move me. That means I watch a bad report and I'm not moved by it. Why? Because I know greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. So I wanna pray for you. If that's you, then would you agree with me in faith? And so I'm asking you to pray with me right now. Let's pray and agree. Heavenly Father, thank you Thank you. Thank you, Lord, that you, you absolutely have full power in our lives. We have given it to you. We give you ourselves, and we ask you, God, 
to help us identify. Holy Spirit, I, help us identify those things in our life that are not pleasing to God, that we need to burn off, that we need to get rid of, Lord, so that when we are tested in the fire, so that when we're thrown into the fire, the fire doesn't hurt us. God, thank you. Thank you, Lord, that we don't have to be afraid. We don't have to fear. We fear nothing because you are with us. And so, Father, right now we pray that the faith of every believer would be encouraged. Lord, that people would be encouraged in their faith. Lord, that people would begin to seek you like they never have before. People would begin to read your word like they've never read it before. And that your Holy Spirit would come in and possess our lives with your presence. God, thank you. Thank you, Lord, that we don't have to be afraid. But God, if we have been, right now we repent. We ask you to forgive us. Lord, we come to you and we repent of fear, of unbelief, of doubt, of sorrow, of concern, of panic. And God, we thank you. We receive your peace. We receive your rest and we receive your faith in our life. Thank you for it. We refuse to have a spirit of fear, but we receive your spirit of power, love, and a sound mind. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Man. This has been so good this morning. And I, it's an honor for me to be able to still get to talk to our congregation, talk to the people that are a part of Vision Church. And I'm telling you, hold on, because best, our best days are right in front of us. And we have amazing things that we're going to be doing uh, in Vision Church. So there's more to come. God bless you this Sunday. Have an amazing day. See ya.